Hey, all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spider. So as many of you all know, I have a weekly podcast. It's been running well. It's going on its sixth year now. And on this podcast, I can discuss some of the tarantula topics in much more depth. And on occasion, I do have a guest. And recently, we had Dr. Andy Anderson, DVM, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, on the podcast to talk specifically about tarantula care and tarantula health. And quite frankly, it was one of the most fun times I've ever had in a podcast because I was learning stuff right along with the audience. So I thought this would be a good one to share over here with the YouTube crowd because there was a lot of great information there. And again, it's not often you get to talk to a veterinarian that actually has experience treating tarantulas. So I learned a lot. I think you'll learn a lot. So this is actually a two-parter. We'll see how it goes. I'm going to put the first part up that is just over an hour for you guys to check out. And then if there's enough interest in it, I'll go ahead and post the second part probably next week or or later this week. So folks can hear the whole story because there's a lot of information in that one as well that I think folks need to hear. So I would say enough of me talking, but there's going to be a lot less of me talking, a lot more of Dr. Andy Anderson talking as we talk about tarantula health care and medicine. So to kick this new season off, I am ecstatic to report that we are finally going to have our interview with Dr. Andy Anderson, DVM, a veterinarian that I've I've alluded to Andy and talked about Andy many times over the course of the years. I think anybody that's followed my podcast has heard me mention him probably at least a dozen times. He has been lurking in the shadows because every time, once in a while, I'll do a topic that will cover something medical and he'll ever so politely chime in with his thoughts on it. It's never like, hey, you're wrong. It's like, hey, just from a veterinarian's perspective, here's what I've learned and here's some of the stuff I think or some of the ideas I have. And it's been amazing because it's like sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I have to come back and do another like intro to a podcast where I say, hey, you know what? I just heard another point of view. And he's he and I have been trying to connect for many, many years. We've both moved. There's been other personal things that have popped up in the way. And I just elated to finally nail it down. I, this this morning, morning before I was getting ready to record, I was like pacing around the transfer room because it was, I had a legitimate excitement about actually getting to talk to him because from a podcaster's perspective, he's a great guest. It's awesome. We get to talk to a veterinarian from a hobbyist, even better. And one of the things I'll say now is that going through this podcast, and I mentioned it a couple of times during it because I was kind of in awe of just enjoying listening to him and explain things. But the neat thing about it was, although we we're having a conversation, a lot of it was me tossing out the, the questions and then as a hobbyist, sitting back and listening to it as one might listen to this podcast. So that was a, 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 something I haven't experienced before where I was sitting there as I'm creating the podcast, almost a podcast listener, hearing what he had to say, hearing some different divergent points from some of the things that I've thought or you know possibly shared in the past. It was just a lot of fun. So to explain how this one's going to work, luckily, the good news is we talk for a while. The entire interview was well over two hours. And I want to make sure that people hear both parts of this because I know a lot of folks like they're listening to it driving to work. They're listening to the podcast in spots where they got like an hour and hours. I've heard a lot of people tell me an hour is a good amount of time. And I don't want people to miss the second half because there's some really great stuff in the second half. So what we're going to do, I, I've decided to run it in two parts. So today is part one in which we cover just some of this background, talk about some really common tarantula ailments and his his viewpoint on them as a veterinarian who has not only ex- maybe experienced them in his own collection because he is a hobbyist and I think that's the unique perspective Andy brings to this is that he's not just a veterinarian working with tarantulas he is a hobbyist who keeps many of them so we're going to have that unique perspective and he's going to get in and tell us about some of the things he's treated and some of his ideas on it which I found to be incredibly valuable and then next week what we'll do is we'll bounce back we will talk about some of the injuries that he's treated. And I really enjoyed that because there's a couple in there and you'll see when we get to it next week that back up things that I try to warn people about. So it was kind of nice to hear somebody else in the profession who has treated these injuries that some people think can't happen, back that up and and give people that warning. Hey, risk versus reward. We've talked about this before in the hobby. So I'm, again, beside myself, Billy and I, after we did the podcast, I started working with it and Billy and I went for our daily walk, walk the dogs. And and I was gushing about how much fun this interview was to do and how much I enjoyed it and how much I personally got out of it. And again, I've mentioned in the past, selfishly, the Tom's Big Spider stuff for me, 
I get information, I get feedback, I get anecdotal comments and information from people that can inform my own hobby experiences. So that's what I take away from this. So don't think this is all completely Tom being completely unselfish, spending his time to it. I get something out of it as well. And this is definitely one I'm going to, it's going to be high on my list of ones that was very informative for me. So as I often say in my videos, enough of me talking, let's get into talking to Dr. Andy Anderson, DVM veterinarian hobbyists and learn a bit about what we should do as far as getting veterinary care for our animals. I was contacted by today's guest way back in October of 2018 when he introduced himself as a veterinarian and asked if he could share my website info with clients. Let's just say my answer was an enthusiastic yes, as I was honestly quite honored that someone in the field of animal medicine would be interested in passing this stuff along. And since then, we've been in contact many times, and I have long planned to have him on the podcast as a guest. Anytime I've done a podcast that's touched upon something in the realm of tarantula ailments and medicine, our guest has always taken the time to reach out and give his expert opinion on it. Well, after several years and several attempts to connect, I'm absolutely ecstatic to welcome Dr. Andy Anderson, DVM, to the podcast. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here, finally. Yeah, finally. We were chatting beforehand. This has been a long, long time coming, and I'm so glad that we're finally able to pull it together because it's been the only good thing I can say is that over the course of the last, oh my gosh, it's been like three or four years at least we've been trying to connect, a lot of different other topics have come out that are worth discussing. I've done other podcasts that will kind of lead as a springboard to some of our discussions today. But I think it's important, and we were talking about this before I actually hit the record button, that we start talking about veterinary medicine as it applies to the tarantula hobby. I think there are, and we'll get into this, a lot of folks, there's a stigma behind it to a lot of folks. They think maybe they've had experiences where they've brought their animals in and have had somebody that didn't quite know about how to treat them. Maybe there's some that just seem to be very reluctant because they just assume nobody's going to know how to treat them. And then I think there's a large contingency of folks out there in the hobbyists that absolutely adore their animals, would do anything for them if they were sick, but feel like there's no outlet or no place to go for it. So to kick it off, Andy, would you like to share a bit about your background? Yeah, um, I have always been interested in reptiles, invertebrates, you know, creepy crawlies, like ever since I was a kid, um, I was always catching, catching insects and spiders and bringing them home and keeping them in my bedroom. And so, um, once I got into college, I decided to pursue veterinary medicine. Um, I worked as a, as a veterinary technician for several years before vet school and during the first few years of vet school, um, and while in school, I spent lots of time in the exotics ward of our teaching hospital, learning um, and doing things, volunteering. And then I graduated in 2013, uh, which I can't believe it's been that long, um, and uh, have been have been doing it ever since. In in 2019, I got certified in pain management. Um, which has been awesome. So I, I get to do a lot of pain consultations and dealing with acute and chronic pain in animals um, of all species. Nice. And um, yeah, I, I wish I saw more tarantulas in practice, but I do, I do, I do see a few. Um, hopefully, after this, maybe I'll get some more, which would be awesome. I'm hoping. <laughs> so, what folks might also be interested in noting is it's not just you treat the animals; you actually have a tarantula collection. I do. I have uh, about fifty of my own tarantulas, which I know this is a safe space, so I, I know I can say that. Yes, you uh, can. I can tell people. <laughs> Sometimes you tell, I'll tell clients when I'm, you know, when I'm seeing their animals or they'll ask or often people will know and their eyes just like get huge when you say you have 50. But uh, I think actually that's not too many when you hear about other people. So, so I feel better, especially when I listen, listen to you talk about your collection. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would honestly, anybody like in my mind, 25, 50, that's still a big collection. I mean, there's, for me, it's more about I do so much with the care and everything. It, it kind of behooves me to have a lot of them because I like to spread my you know feedback on them, how I raise them and everything. But I just received those wide eyes this week. We have a new teacher that started working with us. And it, of course, immediately somebody pointed out that I have spiders. And when I told her I have like 250, 
the eyes light up. They don't understand. And I get it. Mm -hmm. I do, as you probably do. It's not a normal thing to have that. Most people, I hate to say it, are either afraid of them or flat out abhor them. So Mm -hmm. for them to find out, we purposely live with a lot of them. And then I'm sure you get all the questions about, you know, are they all in one cage? Are they out in your house? Uh Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, I, I use ignorance in the the purest sense of the word, not trying to be you know slam anybody. But there's a lot of ignorance behind the hobby and how it works and why we have so many of them. And it's fun sometimes when you convert somebody where they're actually you see they're genuinely interested. But other times I have people just look at me in horror and ask, "How does your wife put up with me?" And then I have I, I love informing them that she helps me with it, and then they even are more horrified. So yes, yeah, I. Uh... Yeah, I, it's kind of weird because uh, people usually know know that about me be- before I've even met people because gotcha. other people that I know have told them. Yep. And they'll be like, oh, you're the tarantula the guy. The tarantula like, guy. Yes, there are other th- <laughs> other things about me, but yes, I do have yep. tarantulas. That's it. And that's the other thing. You are forever defined as the tarantula guy. The school mm-hmm. I work at, my one of my sons and daughter was at before I started working there. And little, you know, I, I did not realize that apparently he had shown them I had a YouTube channel. So all the teachers knew when I came in. So I came into this place thinking I would be, you know, Roan's father. No, I was the spider guy right off the bat. Mm-hmm. It was like, yeah. I, I don't want to say humiliating, but not necessarily how I'd want to start things off with people because they're immediately looking at you like you're a crackpot. Yes. At least you have the background in veterinary medicine. So you can kind of segue into it like that. I, I don't have that. <laughs> I envy you there. Well, thank you. So as far as exotics, you have treated tarantulas before. I'm assuming that mm-hmm. now you, with that background, with that, you know, the fact that you enjoy exotics, you can treat exotics. What, what types of stuff do you get in? I mean, pretty much everything. I say everything except horses. So, um, you know, lots of dogs and cats, of course. Um, fish. So we see koi um, often. Um you know, a lot of bearded dragons, but other other reptiles, snakes, uh, ball pythons, um, lots of rabbits, um, lots of parrots, you know, pretty much anything you can think of, um, I will see. And where I live um, in Southern California, I'm, we are one of the few veterinary hospitals that will see all of those things. So, so we end up seeing quite a bit. A lot. So I'm assuming a lot of people travel down that way when <laughs> they need something. We, yeah. I, well, so we are, we have a mobile hospital, which is oh, awesome. Wow. So we actually, we go to people. So That's it's fantastic. nice. That, I was thinking when you said koi, I was like, all right, do you have to put it in a bucket and bring it down? Like immediately <laughs> wondering how that works. So I'm assuming you would go visit the person in that situation. For sure. Yeah. We have an entire, our, uh, our, um, Hospital is uh, maybe like RV size, so we have a surgery suite, and I mean everything that's in a brick and mortar hospital we have. So uh, we can do do everything. We even have a truck with a CT scanner, so we can do CTs on animals. It's awesome. Yeah, that is absolutely fantastic. I mean, that's what obviously also a a big dog lover, and we have four dogs at any given time, and that's always the thing we've been talking about is. When they get to that age where they're no longer going to be with us, we would love to have somebody that could come to us because it's, right. it's terrible when you have to it's pick them nice. up from their comfort, you know, comfortable environment and bring them to a place like that. So we definitely have to keep a lookout and see if we have anything like that over here. So what, obviously the, the brunt of what we're going to be talking the most of what we're going to be talking about today is some tarantula ailments. I think there's a lot. I've done things on it before. The information out there is... It, there, there's not a lot out there, unfortunately. A lot of anecdotal stuff. We get some stuff from overseas where, you know, sometimes I wonder if they're just drugs that we have over here that are controlled. I've noticed in other countries, not so much, I don't think. Mm-hmm, because when you hear sure. things, yeah, I just went to my local, you know, CV, it wouldn't be CVS, wherever it was, and picked up this drug. And then I go and research and go, oh, great, that'll work. And you look it up and like, nope, I'm not going to be getting that here. So I right. think a lot of out there is just, which is great. I think hobbyists, the one good thing about the hobby, not the one good thing, but a good thing about the hobby is many people are willing to share their information when something happens, good or bad. This is what happened to my spider. This is what I observed. This is what I did. And either A, it got better or B, unfortunately, it did not. So I think there is a huge interest in hearing more of the medical side of it, especially from somebody that has some experience treating them and has a, an interest in them. Because I think the other thing is sometimes they bring them to places and there might not be like, yeah, oh, tarantula, huh? Or we'll give it a shot. So to hear from somebody that actually owns them, likes them, enjoys them, is a hobbyist. You know, 50 gives you that that hobby medal as far as I'm concerned. 
then I think they'd be more open to listening to, you know, in the future, maybe bringing their animals to a veterinarian when there's an issue. So the first one I want to talk about, and I, I'm putting this on here only first because I got two more videos this week of folks who are freaking out because they believe their spiders are showing the symptoms of DKS. Now, as I've tried to state before, DKS, I think a lot of people still think DKS is like a disease where it's not. It's symptoms that the spider shows. So in your opinion, have you experienced this before? What are your thoughts on DKS? So I have luckily, knock on wood, I've, I have never personally had any of my own uh, spiders uh, develop DKS. So that's great. Um, I have seen some um, in, in practice. Um, so the first thing I guess is, like you said, it's not, I think a lot of people think it is a disease yep. itself. You know, oh, they've got DKS. But really, that's just kind of a, a hobbyist umbrella term that we use um, that covers a lot of different things. So um, dyskinetic syndrome is, is, the, is the full name. Dyskinesia is just jerky or involuntary movements. Um, in, in people, people who are being treated for Parkinson's disease, those medications can cause dyskinesia. So those, some of those like head bobbing things that we see or, or those involuntary, you know, facial tics and things, that's dyskinesia. But that is just, it's just a symptom. That is not a disease. And then syndrome tells us that it's a group of different symptoms that we're not quite sure what their cause is, but, but they all seem to go together. Gotcha. So basically <clears throat> it's, it's a collection of, of jerky movements um, without a definite cause, but we call it dyskinetic syndrome so that we can all kind of know what we're talking about. But really there could be tons of, of, of causes. I, I think um, we have two main issues in tarantulas that, that show this. I think the, the most common thing is some kind of toxin that's affecting their nervous system. And that can be, um, you know, chemical fumes from paint or cleaners. I mean, anything that has a scent, it could be essential oils. Um, so Ooh. a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people That's think essential <laughs> oils are safe. Um, I see lots of issues with essential oils, especially in exotics. No kidding. Um, yeah, they can be very toxic. Um, and you know, every, every animal is, is different and they metabolize things differently. So just because something is safe for like a dog or a cat does not mean <clears throat> it's going to be safe for like a bird or an invertebrate. Um, and I actually see a lot of chemical burns and things in dogs and cats with essential oils oh, that no people kidding. apply. Yeah. Um, I actually had a case, somebody was using it, uh, to clean their dog's ears cause it had an ear infection and, uh, the dog's entire inner ear was just like chemically ablated and horribly oh, yeah. infected. So, uh, or fleas, if you, if you treat, use essential oils to treat for fleas, I've seen a lot of animals get <clears throat> perfectly stripe shaped chemical burns down their backs from where the oils were placed. So Ooh. they're not, they're not benign. Yep. Um, so potentially could a tarantula breathe that in or come in contact with it and cause, cause, uh, dyskinesia, you know, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other thing I think is topical flea and tick medications <laughs> that you're applying to your pets. Um, they are very safe for your pets. Every, every dog or cat should be on flea tick and heartworm meds. Um, it, it's very important because they can get diseases. Um, you know, heartworm disease is, is a terrible thing. Um, for dogs, cats, we don't have a treatment for it in cats. So, you know, I, I think everybody should be on it. However, I think if you have invertebrates, you should have them on an oral product because then there's no chance of you getting it on your fingers or somehow it getting on clothing or anything like that and, and potentially contaminating your, your tarantula collection. And it's funny that you mentioned that is I posted up a video many, many years ago of one that had was exhibiting those symptoms. 
And year, you know, it took me a while. I could not figure out what happened. And then I realized we were treating all the dogs with frontline. Is that that's I think the, the ointment that goes down mm-hmm. the back, right? We For treated sure. all the dogs with frontline. I am constantly kissing, hugging, petting, playing with my do- dogs and wrestling with whatever. And I probably had that stuff all over me. And I thought back to this particular spider where the cricket that I was putting in with tongs jumped out, landed on the floor, and I picked it up with my hand and I threw it in the container. And after a while thinking about it, it was like, you know what? There's a very good chance that stuff was on my hand, got onto the cricket and got into the spider. And that's the only, we actually, after that switch to an oral, not that long after that, because I told Billy, I was freaking out because that, at that point I started wearing gloves every time I fed, but then I was worried it was on my clothes. So I, I'm actually relieved kind of to hear you say that because it's been something I kind of theorized about for a while. But I think in my mind, that kind of cinches what happened with mine. Mm-hmm. I, I think that happens more more commonly than than we know, and of course, you know, there there could be any number of other things that could cause it that that we are never we're never going to find out. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, in order to find that out, everybody that has a tarantula that passes from DKS would have to submit it and have testing done, and you know, that's just not that's not viable. Nothing, so a yeah. lot of it we're never going to know. Yeah. Um, supportive wise or treatment wise, there really isn't anything other than supportive care. So, um, you know, keeping them hydrated. um, uh, Sometimes we can get them to drink if they're still able to drink. You can give tarantulas um, injections of fluid. Mm -hmm. So you can inject fluid. Um, You know, your your vet can. Um, I don't advocate people doing that themselves because really bad things can happen, but um, that is possible. And then just waiting. Um, Fortunately and unfortunately, our products work so well that, um, you know, if it is because of an insecticide, usually the tarantula is going to pass away, you know, so uh, almost always. It's weird. Just over the years, I have a lot of people, I put that video up and the, the nice part about it is that I hear from a lot of other folks who are experiencing similar things. And I always ask, have this, has it been exposed to anything? Has it? And there have been other instances where like, you know what? I have been using a flea and tick ointment. And then usually those are the ones I've never heard of one coming back from. Right. But I have had other instances where people have shown me videos. And there was one recently where it like, sometimes they show me videos and it's like, somebody's blowing on their spider it's freaking out and it's moving it's i don't see anything that shows any type of discombobulation it's just the spider was startled and it looked kind of weird and then i get somewhere it's like okay that legitimately looks like the spider has lost control of its its faculties its limbs and then i've had ones like that and recently somebody sent me one and the spider actually turned around it did fine so which again points to i guess the severity of whatever it was that poisoned it Mm-hmm. It could be, you know, it could be something, something not insecticide related. Um, I will say, I think I'll, if you are getting your um, flea and tick products like from the vet or from, you know, they've written you a prescription to get it. It seems like those tend to have a better carrier molecule or a better bioadhesive in them than like over the counter okay. ones. This is totally you know, there's no science behind this really because I can't prove it, but it seems like the -the over-the-counter ones don't stick as well and dry as quickly. So, you know, do with that information what you will. I still think everybody should have oral medications, but it does seem like the 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 cheaper over the counter stuff just doesn't dry as quickly and it tends to spread all over the place a little easier than the other stuff. Um I also think some DKS uh, symptoms that we see is actually due to dehydration oh, and okay. not truly, not gotcha. truly uh, a neurologic yep. issue. So um, we, one of our topics we have that we're going to cover is dehydration. So we can kind of segue into that a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. So I think, um, you know, based on, on, um, my, the patients that I've seen and just, you know, perusing the various boards and, and reading journal articles and stuff, dehydration uh, in, in tarantulas, I think, is, is much more common than we think. Mm-hmm. And I think it causes a lot more issues than, than, than we think. Um, I think part of it is uh, many people don't realize that 
tarantulas move their legs, they extend their legs by pumping their hemolymph into their legs. And so if they're dehydrated, they can't move properly. So that's why when, when spiders die, they, they curl their legs Crawl. up underneath them because there's no more fluid. And so they have muscles that will retract a leg, but nothing to extend it. So the natural shape of the leg is just to kind of retract in on itself. Gotcha. So sometimes you'll have spiders that are kind of wobbly or, or weak or moving around kind of, kind of unusually. And actually they're dehydrated. Um, I actually had, um, uh, my, um, B Smithy, uh, when I got it, it looked like it had DKS when it arrived and was kind of stumbling around and kind of flexing and extending its legs. Uh, and I just gave it some, some water and a little dish. And a couple hours later, it was completely normal. It just needed to rehydrate Rehydrate. itself. So it wasn't actually DKS at all. So I think a lot of people, um, I think that's where I would start if you if you think something is up with your tarantulas, just get it some water. And often they will they can drink uh, and and rehydrate themselves, and we don't have to do anything. Yep, which is nice. And I experience that sometimes in my own collection. Sometimes it's perplexing because it's a tarantula that seems to have access to everything it needs. And if, like so, for example, it has a water dish. It might have some nice moist wash. It might uh, have moss. It might have moist substrate. But I've had situations where I've taken them out, and they seem to have rehydrated and bounced right back. So I think that's mm-hmm. where it can be confusing sometimes because we think, and again, we we like to think we have them set up well. We like to think they have everything they need there. But there, I you know, in my own collection, I've seen instances where it's like, all right, this doesn't make sense. But you take the spider out, you give it some water, and all of a sudden, it's doing fine. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, um, I have seen all of my tarantulas drink, um, all, every single one. So I, I, I give every single one a a dish of water. Um, and I, you know, I usually only refill it like once a week when I do my weekly maintenance or anything, but that's plenty. So I, I usually, if people email or or call and ask questions, the first thing I, uh, I, I ask them is, do you have a water dish dish. and I tell them to do that and then get back in touch with me if, if something is still not right. And usually that does take care of many issues. And I'm glad you brought up the water dish thing because obviously I've been a huge proponent of those from day one and spend a lot of time trying to convince people that no, your spider is not going to fall on it and drown. Yes, your spider is going to drink from it. You may not see it, but it, if it needs water, it's going to be there. It drives me nuts because I it's it seems like it's it's dying down a bit. But for a while, I was getting a lot of pushback from people like you don't need water dishes. I keep them without water dishes. And what nobody could ever like when we get into discussions about it, nobody could ever explain to me. All right. So your spider doesn't need a water dish, yet a lot of us use them and our spiders go to them and use them. Why wouldn't you want to give them that ability? I've seen spiders come right out of their, I've I've filled water dishes a few minutes later, watch spiders crawl right out of their dens, go right over the water dishes and take a drink. Yeah, I don't, I, I, if I could, if I could find out why pet owners of all species don't do certain things. I could probably be a millionaire. I'd write a book or something. <clears throat> it's weird because every every group of of pet owner, you know, that owns like every speed, you know, you've got your tarantula people, you've got the ball python, but you know, mm-hmm. there's always like this one thing with each group, and it's like this very common just refusal to do refusal something. To, yes, and I just. I I can't, I can't figure it out. So tarantulas, it seems to be the water dishes and I don't know what, what the cons are to having the water dish. Uh, I just, some people, they're just, they don't want it and I can't, I don't know. Well, that's, and it's funny you mentioned what are the cons because I remember getting into a real, it was earlier on when I was doing YouTube videos and I got into like a, a pretty elongated discussion. We'll say, we'll call it discussion. It was really de-evolving rather quickly, but I was hitting this guy with points and he's just like, well, what's the point? Wait, that's just, what is, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. They don't have them in the wild. And then I explained, all right, yeah, they may not have them in the wild, but they have other things. It's raining. It's, there's dew on the ground in the morning. We went and all this stuff, but they just didn't want, this individual did not want to listen. And then a couple other people piled on. Yeah, I don't give mine any. They get all their stuff, everything they need from their food sources. And my, my thing has always been, if they didn't 
need them. If they didn't want that water, nobody would use them. They wouldn't use them. We'd put water dishes in. Nobody would have pictures of them using them. And I've been sent hundreds of pictures of tarantulas drinking over the years. The mm-hmm. show that they all different ones. I love the ones like the arboreal. There's no point in putting a water dish in an arboreal enclosure. They won't come down and use it. And there's my, you know, Caribbean Versa caller coming right down from her web, getting a nice big drink. It it just blows my mind because like you said, it's it should be universally agreed upon that they need water dishes. You'd want that security there. And I think the problem is because there are people that don't use them and their spiders live, people point to that and go, well, there you go. They don't need them. <clears throat> and that right. drives me nuts because what they're not looking at is, all right, maybe they're able to survive under most circumstances without maybe you're, the spiders he has, I don't know, he's feeding them in such a way they're getting them the moisture they need to at least live. But is that all the moisture they need? And I'd argue, no, the fact is I've watched ones eat and then come by later on and take a drink as well. So just yeah. I mean, I also, you know, sometimes I'll tell people that are like, well, they're alive. Like, well, yeah, yeah. there's a, there's a big, there's a big gap between being alive and, and death. You know, it's like, yes. why would we just <laughs> want them to, to be alive? Yeah. Why not let them thrive and be healthy? Um, and, and I, you know, and it's not like it's a lot of work. You just, put a dish in there. It can be any dish you want. It can look like anything. You can go really fancy. A lot of my little tiny um, juveniles and some of my slings, I just use the caps of syringes, like the syringe caps. And they make perfect little disposable water dishes if I want to. So even my tiny, tiny guys all have have access to water. I've even seen my... um, Idiotheli Mira come out of her trap door and go take a drink from from her dish. So right, I, that's I think amazing. they all need it. Yeah. Just especially a species that is that reclusive, that is they're reluctant to come out. The fact that they she, she knows she can come right out there and get a drink of water. That's all anybody should need to see, especially with the mm-hmm. species. My, my favorite, Grandma Stola Rosea Porteri, my, the queen I had for years. I had so many pictures of her drinking. This is one that they hate the moist substrate, but my gosh, would that spider drink? It's some of my, my grandma stole poker bees, another species that doesn't particularly like moist conditions, but I'll catch mine drinking all the time. And it, like, mm-hmm. if you see one of those drinking, that should kind of give you a, a, a little <coughs> heads up. If they're drinking, everybody's going to want to drink. Right. Yeah. My, my GBBs both um, drink. I have a female M. Balfouri, you know, and they, they like really dry substrate like i do not put any water in the substrate for her at all but she is she is drinking at her water dish you know um somewhat often and it's nice because if you have those reclusive fossorial species or or you know more more um light averse species sometimes the only time i see them is when they come out to get a drink so it's kind of cool to be able to see them i don't know that that they would come out if i didn't have the water there good call and yeah. so as far as dehydration is concerned, how would you go about it? Somebody brings a spider in and you decide that, yep, this looks like dehydration. What are some of the things you can do to help? So usually the first thing I'll do is just get them a little dish of water and, and let them drink if they're able to. Um, if they're really, really weak, sometimes I'll kind of, I'll kind of put their, their, you know, their, their mouth parts, parts. over the dish um, or you can kind of syringe them a couple drops of water and see if they'll drink it that way. So if if the mouth works and the stomach works, drinking water that way is the best. Gotcha. Um, if they're so far gone that they just can't, you, you can inject them with like sterile um, saline like you would use for an IV. Gotcha. Um, and you can, I'll either give it, um, you, try to, you try to get it in their heart to be honest um, they have an open circulatory system, so they mm-hmm. don't really have vessels or anything. So as long as you're getting it somewhere in, in, um, the opisthosoma somewhere, the fluid's going to get to where it needs get to, to go. It but we pretend like we're actually giving it in the heart. Sometimes I, sometimes in the mm-hmm. larger species, you can, you can yeah, hit it for sure. Yeah. But, um, or, um, you can also give them, uh, fluid injections in their leg joints, Oh, okay. And they'll and they'll absorb it that way. Um, so I've done both, um, and uh, you do need to put a little um, tissue glue 
on the on the puncture wound. Otherwise, the leak came the lymph out of there. I was literally just going to ask because that was my thought. All right, you've punctured him. What happens after that? Okay, right. Yeah, and um, you know, and they do they do pretty well. the The problem is often by the time somebody wants to bring them in, they are so dehydrated that it's you know we can certainly make an attempt, um, but but they've been dehydrated for like weeks, and so it's really hard to bring them back like that. But I have had some bounce back, which is great. So the next one I wanted to ask about, and this has been popping up more lately because I think people are just more attuned that it's out there, is impaction. And that's when it appears that the tarantula isn't able to evacuate feces the way it's supposed to. It gets backed up. The tarantula gets fat, very fat, but there's some signs of it. And then usually the tarantula ends up dying. Now, have you had any experience? I know you have some theories about impaction as well. And I think this is something that again, in the last five years or so, people have been really seeming to recognize as an issue. Um, <clears throat> I haven't had, again, personally, any, any in my collection, thankfully. Um, I've seen a couple, uh, so we don't, we don't know. We don't know the cause for sure. I, I don't think anybody has pr- anything proven. I do think, again, dehydration okay. plays a big role. Um, so, you know, if you if you don't have enough fluid in your system to properly produce waste, um, it it is a lot thicker than it's than it's normally going to be. And so, I do think maybe um, they're passing you know they're passing stool and, and and waste, and it's and it's not liquid enough, and so it is just like building up and yeah. kind of plugging the anus. Um, I, I I can't prove that, but um, I do think that's that's what what kind of contributes to it. And unfortunately, again, often by the time somebody notices yep. it's a problem, they've been impacted for so long um, that what we're seeing on the outside of the tarantula is is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, and they often are just completely full of, of yeah. fecal material and and urates. Um, so. There's again not much you can do. You can try to, you know, soften it, soften the little the little yep. plug, and try to clear it. Um, and I think if you cut it early enough, maybe I think if you combine that with with rehydrating them and also cleaning it, and it was early, potentially we could make more of a gotcha. difference. But by the time by the time people are noticing, usually it's too late, which is awful. It's a terrible a terrible thing to watch. It's not, it's not pleasant. No, I ex- obviously experienced that with one of mine and it was horrific because she was great. She was fine. And next thing I know it, not looking so good. And that was one of those instances where I tried to treat her. We used the moist Q-tip kind of loosened up the area around her anus. We got the plug out and what came out of her was just, oh my gosh, it was horrific how much impacted waste there was. And the weird part was once that fur- that plug got out, the majority of it just came on out, but she looked like she started to move a little bit. I was, you know, fingers crossed she was going to come back and the next day she was gone. So afterwards I kind of went back and tried to look at what were some of the signs I was seeing. And I did see like her dragging her abdomen across the substrate a lot without webbing. I remember one point going, oh, that's kind of weird. Maybe she's got an itch because they will, they'll do these little weird things, you know, hanging around the water. Just There were signs there that unfortunately I missed because I'd never dealt with anything like that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it's it stinks. I hate when I hear stuff like that happens. I also think a lot of our, you know, slings that die just like randomly, you know, people are like, oh, I did everything right. You know, I wonder if it's dehydration in addition to maybe they're impacted, but they're so small, you would never know. Can't tell. Yep. You know, who, who would know? I think a, this plays into our next topic too, but I think again, dehydration definitely causes molting issues and potentially we're having spiders that are molting and everything looks okay, but maybe yep. there's something going on. They have a blockage. They, they have some shed that has been retained around um, the anus. And so we're having issues there, but how would you ever know? Like you can't see it. And it's funny you mentioned that because with this particular specimen, that was she had molted. Everything had been great except she had a little skin stuck to her abdomen right around where her spinnerets <clears> were. 
And I think mm-hmm. they all just moistened it up. It came right off, no problem. But in, in retrospect, I wonder if that was a situation where things were too dry for the molts. There could have been some stuck around the anus. I have heard other people speculate that they've seen this happen after a molt. So something goes wrong with the molt. And leaves this, you know, rather obscure, you know, not many people are shining flashlights in their spiders right. anuses to make sure they're clear. Let's be honest about it. And then that's when it ends up happening. It starts getting caked up. You see the stuff around the end of the spinnerets. And by that point, like you said, it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. And we kind of just segued into molt issues, which I have a funny feeling is going to circle right back up to that dehydration problem again. Yeah. But- yeah. yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So if the one takeaway from this, anybody who's listening, I think would be just make sure they have water um, in some, you know, whatever, whatever dish you want, something um, so that they can go drink. And I really think a lot of these issues, we would see a decrease, not all of them. I mean, they can still get sick. There's still going to be other issues, of course, but I think it would really help. So, you know, molting, tarantulas start developing their new exoskeleton beneath the first one. And then they kind of fill the gap between the two with some fluid. Um, So if you already are dehydrated when that process starts, they're not going to have as much fluid to kind of pump in between the two. So they could stick together and cause a problem. Um, and then uh, during the molt, um, tarantulas will use the, the fluid reserves in the hemolymph in, in their abdomens um, to kind of push fluid throughout the body and, and, and kind of push through that exoskeleton. Yep. So if they don't have enough fluid reserve to do that, um, then of course, you know, they're not going to split open yep. normally and they're going to have trouble um, swelling their, the soft exoskeleton so that they can push out. So I think that's an issue. And, and by the time they're doing that, we can't do anything about it. You know, uh, yep. we, they needed the fluid beforehand. So um, I think, um, you know, potentially you could, again, give like injections of fluid because they actually need it within their body, but they're so soft at that point that, that um, a lot of uh, researchers that have looked into like what you can do for them, they end up lacerating them and then they, they bleed. Ooh. So it doesn't really help. So really, you just kind of have to wait for everything to harden up Um And then if they have pieces that are kind of hanging off, you can take a little pair of scissors and really gently cut just the, the molt, you know, the, the dried out molt uh, away and you're going to leave a part of it stuck to the, to the tarantula. You don't ever want to pull on it because you could, you could rip the exoskeleton underneath. Um, and then often they will, um, fix it with the next molt, but that I think is your cue to make sure that they have plenty of water throughout this whole, um, you know, the, the intermediate stage while they're preparing for the next molt. And then hopefully they won't have an issue the next time. And it's funny you mentioned that because I have a lot of folks that will come to me and go, yeah, I, my tarantula stopped eating a couple months ago. So now I'm, I'm putting water in there and everything. And it's I, my... I always turn around and it's like, well, you want to make sure they have that beforehand. Like don't, or the ones are like, yep, it's getting ready to molt. It's been several months. I've, I've started giving it water at, at that point. Wouldn't it be somewhat too late? Yeah. I mean, really because, so they've already started forming, you know, uh, that, that second exoskeleton. And I, you know, I often, because of how many I have, um, I'll just come in one day and be like, Oh, you know, this one molted. Like I don't, you, I'm not good enough even to pick up on, on sometimes when they're yep. in pre molt. So it's just easier. I think just to always have the water always available, be, you know, if it were up to me and, and I could only give them water when I was guessing when they were getting ready, I would miss it. Most yeah, of I would the fail. time. I would fail miserably. Yeah. So I just think why, why do that to yourself? Just have the water available. So they have it and then you don't have to worry about it. And, um, you know, you don't, 
I think maybe people are worried that they have to go in there every single day and fill, yep. you know, 40 water dishes. As long as you're putting water in there once a week or something, yep. I think that's good enough. I don't think they have to have water, you know, 24 seven. Yeah. So here's a question for you. And I've seen this a couple of times where the spider, the molt fails catastrophically. The spider is almost 100% trapped in the molt. What's I've seen situations where people have carefully gone in and tried to cut all of the older exoskeleton off of it. I, I haven't seen many happy endings to this one. It's usually a severely deformed spider after that. What are your thoughts on when a spider, when you get to that point, and this would be like maybe a vet run, your spider, it's flipped over, the carapace has popped out, its legs are half out, and it just things just grind to a halt. What What should be the course of action then? So it's, it's, it's tough because in a perfect world, we would go in there like immediately while there's st- while that second exoskeleton is still hardening and, and cut them free as best as we can. But because that second exoskeleton is still so delicate, you really run the risk of, of cutting, lacerating them and they will just bleed to death. Yep. So usually what I will that recommend people to do is, um, I mean, depending on the severe, like how badly are they trapped? You know, if they have a few legs free um, and their mouth parts are free, I'll usually just have people leave everything alone and let them harden up. And then either they can cut them away or they can bring the, the tarantula in and we can, we can kind of cut things away. Sometimes you have to anesthetize them so they're not moving and, and yep. um, trying to get away. And then, Burning and then yourself. sometimes you correct. Yeah. And then you can kind of cut things away. Um, but generally if you don't, if you do it while they're not completely hardened, even gently pulling, like trying to, you know, pull a leg out um you can tear you can tear their their exoskeleton and then when they're soft like that they don't really have the ability to stop their own bleeding like they would when they're fully hardened um so unfortunately you just kind of have to wait um if they're if they can't move you know offer them water um you know you can use like a little pipette or even like a teaspoon or something and put water under them uh and try to get them to drink and then wait uh until their until their skeleton is hardened unfortunately with a really big specimen that could be like 3 weeks yeah. you know it could be a month or so but yeah, as long as they're getting water um usually they don't need to eat or anything during that time so it should be okay but it's it's rough I also think um, I think we overfeed our tarantulas a lot, and I think being obese contributes to some of our molting issues as well. So I would, um, you know, once they're obese, there's nothing you can really do about it. They usually don't lose the weight till the next till the next molt. But I would encourage people maybe not to feed so much, especially if they've had an issue in the past. It's better for them to be a little bit. Uh, skinny than than for them to be too overweight, and that's an interesting point because that's one I've I have to say I've been sp- uh, very skeptical about, and I've been kind of wishy washy in my answers when people have asked me. So you do feel like they can they can be they can eat too much, they can become too fat. I think so. Again, you know, I, I have no no scientific proof, like no studies or anything, unfortunately, but it does seem like. Um, when I hear from people or just reading like the forums and stuff, people show pictures and often the, the opisthosoma, the abdomen of the tarantulas that are having issues are just gigantic. Um, I mean, much larger than they should be. And so I do think that contributes. Um, It also is a, they're at an increased risk of injuring themselves. Um, Just kind of moving around their their enclosure when it's that big, you know? So um, I, I usually only feed my, um, juveniles and adults. Um, I try to look at the abdomen and see how big it is. And I will usually only feed, uh, when I can see that, that it's, it, that they've lost some, some plumpness. Gotcha. Um, I tend not to feed them on like a, 
a sca- you know, like, oh, it's it's been two weeks. Let's give yeah. everybody yep. a cricket. Because when I've done that in the past, <clears throat> often I'll, I'll guess wrong and then I'll come back and find one that is just like gigantic. Yeah. Well, that's so, uh, that, that's yeah. some real food for thought in my end because I will say flat out, for <coughs> years, I've always kind of scoffed at that idea only because I've, you know, and again, I don't think because I, I think fortunately because I have so many of them and although I have a quote unquote schedule as I've gotten further into the hobby and older, I've backed off. Now it's more like some of my guys once a month. And what I will often do is if they look a little bit chubby, I'll drop a, like one small cricket in for a larger one, see if there's any takers. If, if it's not taken, that's it. I kind of have it in my mind. It's in pre-mall. But I never actually – I don't know. I, I, I guess I thought in the wild they eat until they're done and then they stop. But then I guess if you think about it, they don't have a situation where they're maybe almost ready to stop. Somebody drops in a big giant roach and fattens them up way overboard. Right. I think, uh, you know, I think prey um, – distribution in the wild is mu- is of course much less than yeah. for us. So, you know, how often are they going to come across like a gigantic yeah, food yeah. source? Probably not very often. So they're going to eat whatever they find, but the odds of like another cockroach coming by, you know, yeah. are, are probably Absolutely. low. Yeah. And if that does happen, it's not going to happen like constantly. So, um, you know, I try not to overfeed. There are some studies in other animals that show that overeating or overfeeding also shortens lifespan. Yep. Um, you know, so I, I tend to err on, on not overfeeding them if possible. You know, again, there's no, I have no proof, but, uh, it no, just makes sense. It's, it's also cheaper <laughs> than, than well, going yeah, out it's and cheaper and if you got the, yeah, I agree. No, this is good because it's funny that I'm, I'm so glad this came up because somebody just emailed me with a question and I hadn't answered it yet about, you know, can you overfeed? I've heard about overfeeding and I hesitated because I was like, you know what? I don't think so, but I realized that I'm not feeding mine as much anymore. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, maybe this was just fate because now we're having this conversation. And now I'll be able to say, all right, you know what? In the past, this is what I thought. But after speaking, you know, to, I can definitely allude to this conversation and put a differing, a differing viewpoint out there. I mean, I think mm-hmm. for me, I just think the problem with me is I don't know if I've ever really had much that I've overfed. I think I, when I've seen them getting really, really big, I usually back way off. And I just stop feeding them for a bit. And then what will happen is, like you said, I'll come back and go, wait a minute. looks like you lost a little bit of size. And then I'll try feeding them again. And I've done that before. So I think I, I'm not – I think and my problem is I'm not considering the person out there that has picked up this spider and maybe doesn't have a lot of them, doesn't have a lot of experience, and is just pumping the food to them. I've had people tell right. me they feed their spiders daily. I've got you know, a, a T. albopilosis, and I, I don't know what's going on. I've been feeding her every single day for the last three weeks, and she suddenly stopped eating. I was like, whoa. So I think part of the problem is, in my perspective, I didn't consider, yes, there are situations where people are just pumping the food to them. Yeah. And I, you know, again, it's one of those things where if I was talking to an owner, I would say, you know, what what are the cons of not feeding as much? And, you know, usually what it boils down to is, well, then I don't get to see them eat. You know, that's Uh, the fun, that's the fun part. The fun part is watching them eat, which I get, but you know, other than that, there's really not a negative to feeding less. So, you know, in my mind, if, if the pros outweigh the cons, um, why not, why not do it if potentially it could help the health of your, of your pet? Agreed. Agreed. I'm, I'm glad we got into that one. Yeah. All right. So the next one I want to talk about, and I don't know if you've had any experience with this, but it's like the big boogeyman that reigns over the hobby nematodes. And fortunately there has been some movement on this where they have identified. I tried to get the the guy that is responsible for this on the podcast, but he's probably thinking, who is this weirdo? But they've done, they've discovered a nematode that they did not know of before that does infest. They, they did some research on where it goes into the spider and how it gets to the spider. They figured out that it is most likely through prey items. And it wasn't an easy transmission. It sounds like they really had to work to get to the spider. But it, what, have you had any experience with nematodes or treating a spider with nematodes? I have had um, one one case where um it we, we ne- I was never able to prove that it was nematodes and this was years ago 
Um, otherwise, every once in a while, I'll get like an email or something and somebody suspects nematodes. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of uh, nematodes and mites are kind of like, yeah. uh, uh, there, it's a little bit frustrating because it's like people are so, so yep. <laughs> concerned with these two things. And yet, you know, back to my water dish soapbox, but they won't give them dishes of water to drink. Yep. But we have this, like, I mean, like nematodes and mites are just this like horrible, you know, boogeyman. And really, they're not that common. Um, especially in captive bred animals. There are so many species of nematodes and they are really hard to speciate out. So really hard to identify. Um, as far as I know, all of them require looking at um, their, their reproductive structures or their mouths or something under, you know, with a microscope. So you can't just look at them and say, oh, it's this nematode. Um, and there are nematodes that live in soil, in water, in, yep. in different animals, some nematodes, you can find them in, uh, insects, but they're not really, they're not causing a problem in that insect. They're just kind of using it to get to the next, you know, animal, um, their life cycles. A lot of them, we cannot even reproduce them in labs. We can't get them to grow in labs because their life cycles are so crazy. So, you know, I don't think it's something that as a, as a hobbyist, I would like stay up at night worrying about yes. if you really think something has nematodes, you really do need to get them to a vet. Uh, and what we do is we um, use sterile saline and flush their mouth parts with it and try to rinse some of the nematodes off um, so that you can look at them. Um, and then somebody much smarter than me would have to look at them. You know, I could say, yes, this, this is nematodes, nematode. yep. but I'd have to send it off to some, spe you know, a parasitologist to see like what species it is. Um, and they've done some, uh, some treatments of different, um, yeah, it sounds like they you know, were having some success with it, it's specifically with this one with tarantulas. They found one that was basically they were congregating around the mouth parts and they did sound like they I was I've been waiting for the update but there was some success with it with treating them. Yeah, I think we need to do more uh you know definitely more studies. The problem is you know tarantulas are so small and so any medication that you that you were that you were going to use is potentially going to affect the tarantula as well. So you have to be really careful um because you don't want to to, to dose the tarantula also. Tarantula, yeah. um, so, you know, no, I, I don't have like tons of information about nematodes other than um, it, it's just not something that I would, that I would worry about. I mean, it's so low on our list of potential things that could happen. Um, and, you know, if you're getting wild caught specimens, I think it yeah. would be a much higher, a much higher risk. Um you know, living in an enclosure in a tarantula room, um, a captive bred animal has a pretty low risk, even feeding pet store crickets and things. Um, most of the time, a lot of the nematodes have to, to go through a different host in order for them to be infective. Even if a cricket had nematodes, depending on the species that they had, tarantula could eat them and they might just pass through. Pass through. So, you know, often like in dogs and cats, when we submit fecal samples, we find like crazy stuff sometimes. Um, and we'll find like, you know, parasites that infect horses and cattle. And that just means the dog was out eating cow pies, which is gross. Yep. But we're just finding them in there. Those, those parasites cannot parasitize the dog. dog. They don't cause any problems, but we're just finding them because they're passing through. Yep. So... I don't think it's it's as huge of an issue as as maybe the the hobby as a whole has been led to believe. And that's kind of been my take. I mean, again, I think when I first got into the world, there were a lot more wild caught specimens, and I think that's where you heard a lot more. But it seemed like if you go on, like if you hop on arachnoids and look them up, it's a lot of older posts 
with folks right. who are getting adults. You know, I got a bunch of adult females. All of a sudden, one of them showing signs of it. So I do that. That was one of the things I try to say, or one of the things I say to people who are freaking out about. Like generally, if you're buying, you know, captive bred specimens, this shouldn't be an issue. And I right. think the other thing you point out is the fact that they. I think a lot of people assumed with the nematodes. It was almost like alien face hugger territory where they get impregnated with them and they burst out their mouths. And what they're finding is they're just congregating around those areas. They're not necessarily right. coming from inside the spider or passing, blowing out of the spider's, you know, abdomen. And there's all, it's not how they work. Right. They're just feeding on the bacteria that are living um, on the mouth parts for, for the most part. I did find um, there is a study where they actually had in, um, spiders that had nematodes and they um, euthanized them or they died and then they um, sliced them up and put them on microscope, microscope slides and looked yep. and they couldn't find nematodes find anywhere in. except the mouth parts. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I are we going to find more about them? Probably. And, 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 and I bet if we keep looking, we are going to find some species that potentially could cause diseases yep. or problems in captive tarantulas. But I mean, it's just, it's so uncommon that, that it's not anything. I don't, you know, I don't constantly live in fear that I'm going to find any toads in any of my spiders, you know, and I have yep. so many that the odds of it are higher than somebody that has like one or two. Yep. So not a, not a big deal at all. I don't think I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned. So hopefully you enjoyed the first part of the podcast. We're going to stop it there now because there's some great topics to come ahead. And I thought it was a good spot right around that hour mark to break, have people give people a chance to digest, hopefully have some comments about it. What are your thoughts? This is going to be an important one because after we got done talking, I think Andy and I both realized that was a heck of a lot of fun for both of us and we'd like a chance to do it again sometime. So there will be a follow-up episode down the road after these two come out where maybe we take listener questions and hear what how Andy responds to those. So if you have a comment or something you'd like him to answer, please feel free to comment on the site. Let us know because we will come back to it. Next episode, as I mentioned before, we will start off with some of the injuries he's dealt with. We will talk about the infamous tarantula ICU and why it may work or why it may not be the cure-all that everybody thinks it is. And then we will talk about the current state of veterinary care for tarantulas and inverts in the United States specifically and why people are so reluctant to try to get veterinary care. We will also discuss tarantula youth in Asia and what Andy believes are the most humane methods to use if you find yourself in a situation where you have to put your spider down. And that's one that was honestly spurred from an earlier podcast I did, some thoughts on tarantula euthanasia methods back in November 22nd of 2020. He and I had chatted about it then, and I had always had this in the back of my, my mind of something I would want to cover later on. So it's going to be a good one. You don't want to miss the second half. There's some great stuff in there and some good information. And again, a huge thank you. I kept gushing while we were talking and after we are talking uh, about how excited I was to actually have been able to do this interview with him. It was, he was an awesome guest. So that will do it for this part of it. Remember, you can find me on TomsBigSpiders.com, Tom's Big Spiders, the podcast. You can find me on YouTube where who the heck knows I'm doing this week. I haven't even done my video yet for this week, so I'm not sure what's up. So it'll be a surprise to both of us. That'll do it for this one, guys. As always, stay safe. We'll catch you all next time.